everybody and welcome to Birdie Hour. My name is Serena and I'm with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory or SFBBO for short. SFBBO is a nonprofit based in Milpitas with the mission to promote sustainability in the Bay Area and beyond by engaging communities in avian science, habitat conservation and education. So this special edition birdie hour is part of our annual California Fall Challenge fundraiser. So I'm actually going to pass things over to SFBBO's Outreach and Communications Director, Kristen Butler, who will share more about that. So welcome, everyone. Good evening. It's um, great to have you guys with us. I'm very excited to be hearing Lynn's talk in just a couple of minutes. I, I listened to her talk two years ago, and it was fascinating. And I understand there's a lot of new research and information that she's been sharing today. So Lynn, thank you again for um, doing this talk and um, and serving as a PBO. So I'm, I know most of you probably saw in our advertising that this is a very special birdie hour because it's part of our 2023 California Fall Challenge fundraiser, which um, is about six weeks of different activities like this one, where we bring our community together, talk about our impact, and ask people to support us um, into the next year. We are a nonprofit and we could not actually offer any of our birdie hours or do a lot of our science and other activities that we do without the support of people in our community. So we really appreciate you being here with us tonight and, um, and supporting our work. And so as Serena mentioned, our, we have a new mission statement actually this year. We went through a strategic planning process, which is a very important process nonprofits do periodically. And we have a new mission statement that kind of speaks more broadly to the activities that we do to promote sustainability for ecosystems and the birds and other animal and human communities that rely on them. And we have a new strategic plan for the next three years. Um, and it has three major um, focuses. The first is to inform. So we want to expand the use of our data and our research and engage more scientific and resource management communities in our work to address all of the important issues you know that are facing our ecosystems and human communities. We want to inspire people to act on behalf of birds and ecosystem health um, by building on our education activities that we are already doing, um, serving more diverse communities through those programs, and then in different ways, inspiring people to take what they've learned from us take what we've inspired them to feel and do something either with SFBBO or in their own communities to help birds and habitats. We're hoping this evening that you'll be inspired by what Lynn has to share and you'll be inspired to take action after this event. And the last prong of our strategic plan is to involve. We know that we're heavily involved with volunteer work here. We're a small group of um, staff members and we couldn't do what we do without our volunteers who participate in our science and education and habitat restoration. And we want to um, engage even more and more diverse communities in our volunteer work. So I want to share some examples. This past year was our first year in the strategic plan of examples of impact doing these things. So kind of briefly in our informed section, we published a paper in San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science. Uh, using data and analysis um, on the surveys that we do, um, reading water birds in the Bay. We also shared about our new fowler rope research with the Mono Basin Fowler Rope Festival. We partnered with IBR to rescue uh, four snowy plover chicks that we reintroduced at Eden Landing. We're partnering with Stanford on a study on how plastics affect land birds and also with Colorado State on a study investigating how songbirds work as pollinators. And we attended the Western Bird Banding Association meeting where we shared uh, some of the research that's being done using CCFS data to study how climate change is impacting birds. In our Inspire category, which I know a lot of you have been to our birdie hours before and you've got to know Serena, she does a wonderful job in our education program and a lot of really exciting things happening with that. We piloted um, a uh, new curriculum using MODIS wildlife tracking for a Title I high school serving low-income communities with our partners, environmental volunteers, and we're hoping to um, build that out with support from the community. We offered a, a shoreline species workshop for the Wildlife Society. Uh, Dan Wenny, one of our biologists, uh, shared his burrowing owl and badger research with the community on different bird walks for the public. And Serena has hosted just more and more of her wonderful birdie hours with a special focus on bringing in more diverse speakers so that we can um, 
uh, bring in larger community to the work that we're doing and have an interest in birds and nature. And then the last prong is involved. And so a lot of our involved work, we're really kind of building out and growing how people get involved in our tidal marsh restoration. So we've had several projects with marshmallow mines and, and school kids, um, uh, Skyline College and other university students and groups like UC Climate Stewards helping with our tidal marsh restoration. And then Serena also mentored a group of teenagers who analyzed the kinds of plants that birds in their colonial water bird program are using, and they wrote a wonderful report about it on our blog. So now that you're inspired, there's lots of ways you can help support this work as part of the CFC. So you can make a donation to the California Fall Challenge between now and the end of October. Any donations over $80 to this um, will get to uh, be eligible to re receive our shirt. And you can see the artwork for the new shirt is here and it's focusing on owls, burrowing short-eared and great horned owls. It's really beautiful. And we're hoping everyone will like it. It's on a black shirt. And um, we are taking pre-orders right now and we will, we will print them in early November and mail them to people. So we hope that you'll get a shirt and wear it and tell the story of birds and get more people involved in our work. If you are interested in the bird banding station where we do our uh, land bird research, you can pledge or make a straight donation to our band of fun. As part of that, if you make a donation, you'll get updates every quarter about what's going on at the station. And we'll also invite everyone, even people who haven't donated to participate in our bird bingo game through the next couple of weeks to learn more about the birds at CCFS. We also have a brand new uh, Urban Green Spaces photo contest, which is going on until the 21st. There's more information about this on our website. We have wonderful prizes and there are a lot of different categories. And so we're hoping that it's not just bird focus, it's any kind of habitats and there's a lot of different information about that on our website. So if you like to take photos, even if you're not really, really good at it, we'd love for you to participate in this. And then we also have a fantastic online silent auction. And I wanna highlight here that there's a great Burrowing Owl Habitat Walk led by Lynn as part of the auction. So if you wanna learn more about owls and get to know her, then please bid on that. We also have a marshland boat tour for two people with some folks on our staff out in the tidal marshes. It's kind of a, a really personal uh, way to get to know what's living in the marshes and how we're helping them. And there are a lot of other activities and uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, stuff that you can get for a lot less money than you normally would. So great deals for that. If you don't have to give any financial information, just go online and bid on that. And so um, just kind of to recap that we hope that you will be inspired by Lynn's talk and be inspired to action by supporting our California Fall Challenge. There are many different ways to do that. And last but not least, you'll see in the corner here that Stephanie Ellis, who used to be our uh, on staff here, um, is going to be doing wonderful snowy owls, 30 hour in a couple of weeks um, to kind of go with the owl theme that we have. If you have any questions about any of these opportunities or activities, you can ask Serena or myself. Okay, Serena, so go ahead and uh, take it away. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Lynn Trulio, who has been on the faculty at San Jose State University for nearly 30 years. And there she conducts research investigating human impacts to species and habitats and seeks effective methods to mitigate or eliminate those impacts. During that time, she has also served as the lead scientist for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project, um, as well as an environmental and engineering fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and as a visiting scientist in the wetland division of the US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Dr. Trulio has also been a longtime member and collaborator with SFBBO and currently serves as the co-chair of the board. So Lynn, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to hear your talk. All right. Well, thank you so much, Serena, for that, that nice introduction. And I will share my screen now. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here this evening to hear um, this talk about burrowing owls. Um, I've been studying burrowing owls for over 30 years in California and uh, elsewhere, but mostly California. And um, I really can talk ad infinitum about them. So I will, <laughs> I'm going to be bringing you some, some new information that we are, are learning about the, the uh, burrowing owls that live here in Silicon Valley with us. So this evening, I'm going to give you a little bit of burrowing owl background in case you um, are not um, as familiar with the species. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some recent research into their behavior 
and um, I'm going to tell you about behavior of um, breeding birds and their choice of mates. And then I'm also going to talk about uh, wintering birds and migratory behavior. And then finally, <clears throat> I'm going to see what this kind of all means for sustainability. So what burrowing owls know about sustainability? They know a fair amount, actually. <laughs> OK, here's the subject of our um, the talk this evening, um, the burrowing owl, Athena cunicularia. And um, its name means little miner, which is um, a, a good name for it. Um, these, these guys um, are known to, you know, they live on the ground, they live in burrows, and we'll talk more about that. Um, there are, I, I should have said, approximately 20 recognized subspecies, <laughs> you know, depending on if the taxonomists are lumpers or splitters at the time, but there are quite a few subspecies of burrowing owls. This is a new world owl that lives in North, Central, and South America, and you can see that it's got a very wide range. Um, and it's found on the islands in the Caribbean. It's actually the national bird of Aruba. Um, so this evening, we're going to be talking about Western burrowing owls, Athena cunicularia hypogea. And this subspecies is found in prairie habitats from uh, southern Canada to northern Mexico um, and the plain states all the way out to the Pacific here. And you can see that on this map here. The western burrowing owl is, um, its range is from, you can see the plain states all the way out here to California. They nest in burrows dug by other species. And in particular, they nest in burrows dug by um, California ground squirrels. And I'll be talking a lot more about them. You can see here a burrowing owl kind of telling a ground squirrel what for. They, they get along pretty well, actually. Um, so the squirrels dig burrows that, that the owls use. The owls will use lots of other burrows, such as those dug by, um, uh, dug by um, lots of, you know, depending on where they are in the range, could be desert tortoises, um, could be um, badgers. We use badger burrows in our region. Um, they are an urban adapter, which means they can survive in urban settings to some extent, um, up to a certain point. Um, and they actually are one of the few birds of prey that do fairly well in agricultural settings. And so they are found in, um, in, in fact, the, the greatest uh, population of owls in California is in the Imperial Valley, which is entirely agricultural. Um, so although they're somewhat adaptable to human altered landscapes, they are declining throughout their range, including in urban settings. This is the range of the Western burrowing owl. I pointed it out before. On the left, you can see um, that it has a pretty wide range, although interestingly, um, as climate changes, the burrowing owl's range is changing. Most species are adapting to climate change by moving north as things get warmer. Burrowing owls, being the contrarians that they are, are actually <laughs> expanding south, <laughs> and their range is declining from the north, east, and the west. Uh, they um, breed through in that orange range. They breed there and then migrate. Um, and then in the purple range, which includes us, we have year-round burrowing owls. And on the right is, is a map uh, by Wilkinson and Siegel from a few years ago, 2010. Um, which shows the, where burrowing owls are located in California. And I study them here in the San Francisco Bay region, which is a very small uh, uh, part of the population. If you go all the way down to the Imperial Valley, you can see that almost 70% of California's burrowing owls live in this one small area. So although they're distributed throughout California in grassland areas, um, they're they're relatively um, they're 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 relatively sparse and they're very vulnerable uh, to being extirpated because so many of the birds are in one very small area. Burrowing owls are a very odd owl. They do not hoot. Uh, they make lots of other sounds, but they don't hoot. Uh, they're active day and night. Um, they're especially 
you seem especially active at dawn and dusk crepuscular but they're active day and night i don't really know when they sleep but you know they seem to take cat naps during the day or so um it's the only owl that lives in nests underground and its life revolves around the burrow it does lots of very interesting behaviors, including lining burrows with different types of materials, such as dung or burrow, we call them decorations, um, and they will collect a, a wide range of things. Um, I knew some owls that live near a, a McDonald's, and they would collect the napkins and rip up the napkins and put them out in front of their burrows. So burrowing owls are pretty messy little guys, and you can really tell their burrows because of all of the flotsam and jetsam on the, on the outside. Um, and interestingly, the juveniles do a really terrific rattlesnake mimic. It is an absolute acoustic mimic. There aren't too many of them. And um, it's a very, a very effective mimic at keeping predators away and also keeping researchers' hands out of their burrows. Okay, so I mentioned their life revolves around their burrow. And in our region, their burrows are dug by California ground squirrels. California ground squirrels are a colonial rodent known as sciurids, and they're closely related to prairie dogs. Um, so basically, they're our prairie dog. And like prairie dogs, they live in a, an open grassland environment. And that's where burrowing owls live. They want an open grassland environment. They don't want to see a lot of trees. They like it. It's like you can see some of these places completely no vegetation. That's perfectly fine with them right around the burrow because they want a good view. They don't want it. They're not trying to hide. They want a very good view of predators approaching them so that then they can dive into their burrow. They um, are colony cohabitants with the ground squirrels. The ground squirrels dig the burrows. Owls take over burrows that squirrels dig. Um, Squirrels dig zillions of burrows, so it really isn't a big hit for the squirrels. And um, the owls also respond to uh, 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 ground squirrel alarm calls. These guys, the owls and squirrels, have a wide range of, um, you have to deal with a wide range of predators, large predators, aerial predators, such as red-tailed hawks, on the ground coyotes, rattlesnakes. And um, the burrowing owl, will respond to the alarm calls of California ground squirrels. And they have quite a range of alarm calls. I was, I had a student who studied the alarm calling behavior and I was hoping, I was wondering if the squirrels responded to the owls alarm calls. And the squirrels really didn't. They kind of trust other squirrels. They didn't really trust the owls that much. <laughs> and so I, I was always left with this question, what are the squirrels getting out of this? You know, it, not really very much, but um, the owls aren't very abundant, so it's not a big hit, you know, when it comes to squirrels that the owls are living in their colonies. And I said they're colony cohabitants, they don't live in the same burrows, but they live in burrows nearby. Here's what the adults look like. They're about seven and a half, nine inches, to nine inches tall. They weigh a little over a quarter of a pound. Um, they have long legs with very few feathers, and this is ideal for living on the ground. And although they don't dig their burrows, they will kind of modify them and do some digging in there. And so that's helpful not to have feathers on their legs, but not having feathers is also a way of thermoregulating. So it allows heat to escape through their legs. Um, they're this beautiful mottled brown and cream and they blend extremely well. As you can see the sky in the, in the lower right, they blend very well into the grassland, very, very well designed for camouflage. Bright yellow eyes, no ear tufts. And um, you'll see them on the ground or on low perches every once in a while in a tree, but that's not where they hang out. They are a grassland bird. The adults themselves are not sexually dimorphic. In other words, you can't tell the male from the female, especially early in the season. They look pretty much alike. Um, most raptors, the females are larger than the males actually in burrowing owls, the males are slightly larger than the females. Again, very contrarian. Um, later in the season, you can see some behavioral differences between the males and the females. Only the males do this threat display with the white eyebrow. They're the only ones who make the cuckoo call. 
which is a territorial call. And um, because the females spend a lot of time underground uh, with the chicks and the eggs, they, and this guy will stay on the surface. He tends to get bleached out by the sun. So later in the year, in the breeding season, the males will be much lighter than the females. That's another way of telling them apart, but really they aren't sexually dimorphic, which is a um, another way of saying they're monogamous. They're monogamous, at least for a season. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that kind of behavior a little later. Here are the chicks. Um, they're out between May and September and they start as little fluff balls and then they grow. And so here's how they, they grow over the season. When they first come out, they still have natal down and then they start to grow, start to lose that natal down and to turn into get juvenile plumage. Here's a bunch of them, okay, with the juvenile plumage. And then by the end of the season, August, September, they are the same size as the adults. Very quickly, they get to be about the same size as the adults. You can tell these guys look different. They don't have the modeling yet, but they will molt at the end of the season in September, and then they will look just like adults. And then the next year, when they're one year old, they are adults, and they're ready to go out, find a mate, and breed. Burrowing owls lay more eggs than any other bird of prey, up to 11 or 12. Typically, we see broods of between four and eight. All right, breeding burrowing owls are declining in California. And there's plenty of evidence that started in the 80s um, that um, breeding groups were disappearing. Um, the red counties are places where burrowing owls had once Breeding burrowing owls had once existed, but are now extirpated. And um, in our area, they are nearly extirpated. Um, in the San Francisco Bay area, uh, they are declining. In California overall, they are a species of special concern. In Santa Clara County, where I've been studying them for um, a number of decades, um, I was started tracking their progress um, based on a baseline from 1988. And you know that Silicon Valley developed very quickly during this period and the number of owls declined, you know, locations of owls declined. And, and this decline in the number of owls, we've actually been counting the owls, not just their locations, have been declining drastically for decades. Now there are fewer than 25 pairs in all of Santa Clara County. So they are very much on the brink of being extirpated as a breeding bird. Why is that? Well, primarily the impacts of urbanization. The habitat destruction, you know, this is a grassland species. It's the easiest place to develop grasslands, right? They're flat, don't have a lot of trees. Um, and, you know, then the birds are squeezed into smaller areas, which results in increased predation. They're more easy, easily picked off by predators. And actually the predators themselves get squeezed into these little habitat islands and so there's more predators in urban settings there's constant disturbance of burrows constant disturbance and that's a huge problem so populations of birds not just burrowing owls but other birds um, are declining even among urban adapters so remember i mentioned that burrowing owls can live in urban settings up to a certain point in development. Basically, until land coverage reaches about 60% land coverage, they can, they can live alongside us. But once it starts to go beyond that, burrowing owls disappear very quickly. So these are factors, but we have wondered if there are some population factors or behavioral factors that might be contributing to the decline in urban settings. And so my colleagues and I had this question about whether the behavior of burrowing owls might be becoming disrupted by um, urbanization. And so we looked at three types of behaviors, mate fidelity, which is the, the ability to remain with a mate from year to year, nest site fidelity, which is the desire or ability to stay at a nest site from year to year. 
and breeding dispersal. That's the movement between breeding sites. Between, and we looked at between years. So we wondered, might disruptions to these behaviors be contributing to the breeding burrowing owl population decline? So as urban pressures were building, was mate fidelity getting disrupted? Was nest site fidelity getting disrupted? And we looked at um, burrowing owls in these seven island grassland sites around the south end of the bay where they had been breeding for a long time. During the period of this study, which went for 17 years, um, burrowing owls declined from 128 adults to 36. So during this, this is a period of rapid decline. So we wanted to see if this decline was disrupting their behaviors. So without going into too much detail, we studied them for 27, or sorry, 17 breeding seasons, and we captured and banded um, as many owls and young as possible. We um, and we analyzed whether birds stayed together year after year, and if that changed, and if they stayed at the same site year after year, and if that changed over time. So <clears throat> I want to thank my colleagues Deborah Cromsack and Phil Higgins, um, <clears throat> my long-term burrowing owl. Um, colleagues who collected many years of data. I collected a number of years, but they collected a lot too. Um, so one thing we found is that <clears throat> burrowing owls want to stay with the same mate at the same site. They don't want to move and they want to stay with the same mate the next year. So not only are they monogamous within a season, they want to stay with the same mate. And um, we also found that um, in some part of the time, they would keep the same mate and move to a new site. That was very uncommon. If they had to move to a new site, very often <clears throat> it ended up meaning they had to get a new mate. Okay, so moving meant getting a new mate. Staying, which they wanted to do, really meant staying with the mate that they'd had the year before. And these, these behaviors, mate and nest site fidelity are very tightly linked. Mate fidelity, staying with a mate. Okay, don't worry about those numbers. A lot of birds stayed with one, with their mate from one year to the next, over 50% of birds. And it was the same for both sexes. And what we found was that breeding success the previous year was really important to males. Um, females just kind of wanted to stay with their mate no matter what. <laughs> um, and we found that there was no change in the behavior over time. So mate fidelity did not change over time, despite the fact that population was declining very drastically. Nest site fidelity, staying at their site, success the previous year. In other words, if they had chicks was important to males. Years with mate, the number of years with their mate was very important. And again, time, change in time was not a factor. Same pattern with dispersal distance. Birds stayed closer if they had success the previous year with their mate, in other words, produced chicks. And if they basically just, <laughs> the longer they stayed with their mate, okay, the shorter their dispersal distance. And again, this behavior did not change over time. So basically we found the longer the relationship between pairs, the more chicks they had. So they want to stay with their mate, and they want to stay in the same place. And I think we all can kind of identify with that. <laughs> they don't want to be disturbed. So we found that these behaviors, these important breeding behaviors were not influencing the population decline. Other factors were doing that. And years with mate was a key factor in the number of chicks produced. So what this means is we need to preserve nest sites um, for the long term. We need to make sure the colonial rodents and their burrow systems are protected because that's where the owls live. So that's a little story about breeding birds. Well, so we've learned quite a bit about breeding birds. We have these year round residents that are here all year, but we know there are also these birds that turn up in the winter time in places where birds aren't breeding, like coastal zones, bay edges. We really don't know anything about them. We've been focusing on the breeding season and breeding birds, which of course is very important, but the winter season is also vital. And we wanted to learn more about wintering birds. 
we know from satellite telemetry studies conducted by other researchers that in a lot of the range, burrowing owls are migratory. Our birds are not, but what we can see is that it looks like some migratory birds might be coming to visit, perhaps, in the wintertime. Okay, but no one's really described what's going on here. So we wanted to know what's going on with wintering burrowing owls in Santa Clara County. We know we have them, but we didn't know who the winter birds were and what the relationship was between winter birds and breeding birds. And what is the migratory pattern that hasn't been described and, you know, research is needed. I will say that one of our primary goals in uh, conducting this research was the hope that by finding winter birds in unusual places where we hadn't been looking, that we might ultimately find new breeding colonies in places we hadn't looked before. So that was our holy grail. We were Wanted to learn about these winter birds, yes, but we we're actually hoping to find new breeding colonies by doing this work. Um, so I want to again thank my colleagues um, and also the funders who made this research possible. We did the research in the in Santa Clara County in the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan area. We included those breeding sites that you heard about just before, but we also went out to the foothills <laughs> on either side of Coyote Valley. You know, up there, you know, as you're going, going down 101, those hills, that's where we went looking for burrowing owls in the wintertime, too, because people told us they saw lots of owls there. People like Steve Rottenborn and people who were around all the time. So we um, found winter birds by local experts, eBird uh, and Christmas bird count locations. We captured birds in the wintertime using a spring trap, which has a mouse in here. And um, no mice were harmed, by the way, in the process. Um, it just attracts the owls, um, except maybe psychologically. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what happens is we have the, we set the trap. You can see the mouse up here, um, the owls. And then we have this collar, which uses the burrowing owls, um, the burrowing owls uh, call, the cuckoo call with the male makes. And Males are attracted to that cuckoo song because they were like, hey, who's this guy in my territory? And they come up to the call, they see the mouse, they grab the mouse, and it springs the trap. And the females, it turns out, are very um, interested in that cuckoo song, too, because they're like, hey, who's this guy in my territory? And uh, they go up there and they also get caught. So we hadn't caught owls in wintertime before, and this was a very effective method because they they aren't, they're trying to keep a low profile. They're very hard to find. So we captured as many birds as we could in the wintertime and banded them. And we captured birds both at these foothill sites, but also birds that were unbanded at the breeding sites. Because remember I said we banned all the breeding birds, but in the wintertime there were some unbanded birds. So who were they? So we would grabbed them and banded them, and then we banded these birds, you know, up in the foothills. Then in the summer, we went back to all the places where we caught these winter birds to see if we could find them. We went to look for the birds we banded in winter at the known breeding sites, and also at these foothill locations of wintering birds. And you can see these dots show where we found these red dots at the top, were birds, unbanded birds, that we found in the wintertime that we banded. And these blue dots up in the hills here <clears throat> were birds that were unbanded, that we captured and banded. I will say we found one banded bird up here in the hills. And that bird was banded in British Columbia. Uh, we have colleagues up there who <clears throat> breed uh, burrowing owls. And that bird was banded in the summer. <laughs> it was a chick. And it flew down here in the wintertime and we caught it. So, okay, there's a long distance migrant for you. Okay, <clears throat> so what did we find? We went back to look for the winter birds in the summer and we found that birds, um, we found birds only in the known breeding sites, okay? In other words, there were no birds in the foothill sites where we abandoned them in winter. We walked all over the place and there were no birds <laughs> at the foothill sites. And none of the unbanded birds that we banded in winter at the breeding sites were still there in summer. They were gone too. 
So all the birds that we banded in winter that have been banded disappeared by summer. And sadly, we did not find any new breeding sites. So there were no new breeding sites, but we found lots of wintering owls. And what this graph shows is that the blue are the breeding sites and the pink are the foothill sites. In the winter time, we found a bunch of birds at the breeding sites, including our already banded birds and then the unbanded birds. So like in the winter time in 24, 2014, there were 65 birds at the breeding sites. In the summer, the next summer, only 52. The foothill site found some owls. The next summer, no owls. And so you can see that same pattern, more in the winter, a lot fewer in the summer. This is a clear indication that <clears throat> these birds that we were capturing in winter were migrants. They were not part of our breeding population. And that was super great. But we wanted to know who were these migrants. And for that, we had to turn to our colleagues at the Bird Gene Escape Lab at Colorado State University. <clears throat> Dr. Kristen Ruig and Dr. Kristen Basu, the two Kristens, um, who are genomic specialists. And what they were able to do was look at the genomes of our birds and determine if they were our local birds or if they were long distance migrants. So we wanted to know that. And we also wanted to know if some summer birds might be long distance migrants that stayed to be residents. In other words, did some of these migrants decide, hey, the Bay Area is great. Let's just stay here and not, and not migrate. <laughs> so we looked into that <clears throat> using feathers that were analyzed by um, Kristen Ruig's lab. In winter, all the birds that we banded in winter that we had that had been unbanded were long distance migrants. They were all coming from outside California from other parts of the range. In summer, we, we, we looked at the birds in summer too. So we looked at our resident birds and we looked at, we looked at our resident birds in summer. And what we found was that there were a bunch of resident birds here year round, but there were a couple of migrants in the summer. So they were a couple of migrants decided to stay and become a resident. And we found a bunch of birds that were hybrids between the residents and the migrants, which means that migratory birds have been staying to breed with our resident birds over time. And that is really great because our population is small and it's isolated. So having migrants stay to breed means they're adding new genes to the gene pool. This is the first time anybody showed this type of behavior or hybridization, and we're getting our work published in conservation genetics. So <laughs> um, it's a really, a really um, neat study, and that you know was impossible without the new amazing genomic techniques that exist. So I told you two stories now: one about breeding birds and what they need. They need stability, they need ground squirrels and winter birds. And the fact that, you know, currently we're losing a lot of our, our breeding birds, right? Which is very distressing. And we're taking measures to try and turn that around. But one thing we can say for sure is that every winter we host in the Bay Area, I mean hundreds of birds from other parts of the range who come here for the winter, find great winter habitat, and then go back and breed in other parts of the range. So our, our beautiful hillsides, which in particular are a lot of hillside protection, are pro really doing a great job at protecting habitat from migratory winter owls, and that's fantastic. So we're helping owls from around the range. Um, we're hoping to also help our breeding birds. And that leads me to this question of what do burrowing owls know about sustainability? So what, is, what does it mean to have, you know, breeding burrowing owls in particular, what does that mean for sustainability? And the fact that burrowing owls are declining, what does that mean? Well, first of all, I think you all have heard of the research conducted by Rosenberg et al. 
um, which found that since 1970, the U.S. has lost approximately 2.9 billion birds. So we are losing birds at a very rapid rate. <clears throat> and grassland species, such as the burrowing owl, have suffered the greatest loss. And you can see um, the graph on the right shows one happy story. Wetland birds have increased. We have done a lot of wetland protection and restoration, and it's had an effect on wetland species, which is fantastic. And these are mostly inland wet, wetland species, because you can see coastal species and everything else is declining at the very bottom grassland. Um, approximately 50% of grassland species are declining, as in burrowing owls being one of those. The primary reasons are habitat loss to urbanization, but especially agricultural conversion and the extreme use of pesticides. Pesticides are destroying um, the you know, destroying um, the insect prey base and everything else, which makes it impossible for birds to survive. Over 90% of birds eat insects, and we are we are decimating the insect population. Um, another population we have decimated are these colonial rodents, such as California ground squirrels and prairie dogs, which are essential to the structure and the ecosystem functioning of grasslands. I don't know if anybody saw on PBS last night, there was a really great show on grasslands. And I really talked about keystone species and they talked about prairie dogs. Um, as keystone species in their habitats. And when you lose these keystone species, the habitats decline. <clears throat> and so do um, a vast number of species in the habitats. When we lose grasslands, people lose out too, okay? People are losing too. So first of all, I mentioned that over 90% of bird species eat insects. And these insects, you know, it's it's an essential ecosystem function that they, instead of using pesticides, we should be using birds, right, to eat insects, right? So <clears throat> they perform a fantastic function um, for, um, for agriculture. Um, of course, birding is a multi-billion dollar industry and of course, a, an incredible source of enjoyment for millions of people. In addition, grasslands such as the one shown here in the upper right, which is in the Bay Area, are fantastic places for recreation, where people can get away from the urban setting. We didn't evolve, you know, in cities and suburbs. <laughs> we evolved out here, you know, in nature. And it's very meaningful, and, and our, our whole body responds positively to being in nature. <clears throat> one other thing I wanted to mention that the bottom right picture indicates is that Grasslands are super duper carbon sequestering habitats. In other words, grasslands pull in a huge amount of carbon. That carbon is stored in the ground and it builds up in the ground, okay? And uh, a recent study from UC Davis shows that grassland habitats are a more stable, and um, dependable source of carbon sequestration than forest habitats, especially in California. Because when forest habitats are burning, which is gonna happen more and more, all that carbon goes into the air. The carbon in forests is in the standing biomass. The carbon in grasslands is in the soil. So when a grassland burns, most of the carbon is still there. And so having more grasslands is going to be essential for pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. I contend that if you have burrowing owls, which can be a little picky in their habitat requirements, you have an umbrella species, a species that if you have burrowing owls, you have a number of other species. So kestrels, horned larks, other larks, um, lots of bird species. So if you, because burrowing owls are this, this top predator, um, and so you also have 
um, these other prey items that are necessary to other bird species. Of course, you have California ground squirrels. You must have ground squirrels if you're going to have burrowing owls. Um, it creates habitat for rare and endangered species, such as this bay checker spot butterfly, um, large carnivores, such as badgers and um, coyotes, and um, also great habitat for people to enjoy. So when you have burrowing owls, you have this kind of umbrella species that you can be sure you have a lot of these, these other uh, elements of the ecosystem. But let me just say the real hero is the California ground squirrel. The California ground squirrel is an ecosystem engineer. And without the California ground squirrel, you do not have um, California grasslands that support this range of diversity. And you can see that um, California ground squirrels in conjunction with a grazer. So in prairie grasslands, you have prairie dogs and buffalo, right? We don't have any buffalo, we're not gonna have any buffalo, but it turns out that cattle are pretty good grazers. And so if you combine, as long as there aren't too many, you know, it's done properly, California ground squirrels plus grazers in protected habitat will result in a very rich um, <clears throat> grassland ecosystem that supports biodiversity, sequesters carbon, provides great places for humans to be. So we've done a pretty good job of protecting hills and ranges in our area. And now we're working um, uh, post and the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority are working to, to protect grasslands on the valley floor, Coyote Valley. We need to protect valley floor grasslands. And when we do that, we will have a very rich grassland environment that protects burrowing owls and lots of other species too. So I wanna thank all of you for listening to my talk today and all of the collaborators over the years who have helped to make this research possible um, just couldn't be done without all of them. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lynn. I, I learned so much about burrowing owls and thank you for all the work that you do to protect them. Um, it was really interesting to hear about. So we have uh, a couple of questions in the chat and I'll yes. just go ahead and jump right in and get those to you. Love questions, so, let's hear them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, the first question, uh, you, you did touch on this already uh, with the California birds, the Santa Clara County birds, but yes. um, in the beginning of the talk, you showed a range map and in their year round range, um, mm -hmm. the question is, are those resident birds or are they different individuals in the breeding and wintering seasons? Oh. Or does it differ in different locations? That's, <laughs> that's a great question. And the paper that's getting published talks all about this. Um, let's look at the range here. Um, there's back here, way back, 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 back. Maybe it's, there it is. Okay, great. So yeah. So what happens is that burrowing owls actually exhibit a wide range of migratory behavior. Some birds, like a lot of birds in California, are completely resident year round. Don't go anywhere. They stay in their area. <clears throat> but other birds in other parts of the range, such as in Canada and the Northern Plains states, they are completely migratory. Everybody leaves in the winter and goes south, okay? However, in places like New Mexico and Texas and um, Arizona, you have birds that stay year round. You have, a resident, you have a breeding population. Some of them stay year round, but some of them migrate. <laughs> That's a, called a type of, that's called mark partial migration. It's a type of partial migration. Our population also shows a type of partial migration in which we have residents that are joined by migratory birds in the winter. None of our birds go anywhere in the winter, whereas in other parts of the range, we have a breeding population. Some stay year round, but some of those guys will migrate. So it's, and a lot of species are like that, exhibit partial migration. Great question. Yeah, and here's another good question. Is there a risk that the local genome will disappear as local birds are disappearing and migrants are slowly taking over? Okay, fantastic question. A few years ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you anything about that, but <clears throat> thanks to the work of um, 
Kristen Ruig and her grad students, um, including a guy named Kelly Barr, who is publishing his research, we know that um, this population is, is an inbred population and that it does have a unique genome, um, but we believe that the genome is not like a locally adapted genome, you know, it, an ecotype. We believe that it's a genome that it's losing, it's, it's losing uh, diversity, okay? And so <clears throat> if our population disappears, then yes, our unique genome will disappear. But it is a genome that is, is probably somewhat inbred. Um, but, you know, that said, there could be some really, you know, great aspects. We don't know all about everything about the genome, but there could be some really great aspects of this population that you'd really want to hang on to. Like maybe they are somewhat adapted to the Bay Area, right? So we're trying to keep them. And what we're trying to do is um, <clears throat> other members of my team are doing this. Uh, we have a captive breeding program where we're trying to using birds from our region, captively breed birds and start new populations in Coyote Valley. So that hopefully we'll continue that genome and it will become more diverse and that we'll actually have stable populations that aren't being disturbed all the time. Thank you. Yeah, and related to our local birds, what would yeah. be a good target for a healthy burrowing owl population in Santa Clara County? You guys have such great questions. That is a great, great question. Um, yeah, okay, so many studies have indicated, <laughs> I'm just gonna say this number, that a population of 500 interbreeding individuals is what you need for a viable breeding population. I don't think that's realistic at all. And, and I don't think necessary because our population actually is not genetically isolated. We're getting migrants that come in today, right? So what we like is a population that's large enough to, to sustain itself. And we believe, you know, probably a population you know, I, it's really hard to say. What we're looking for is a population that has enough genetic diversity, and you know, maybe that would happen at 50 or 100 birds, that is self-sustaining, okay? Where it's, we're producing chicks, the chicks are going places, the number of adults is not going down, it's just, you know. So that's, you know, ideally, we're hoping for populations that will expand because there's a tremendous amount of, of potential habitat, you know, in Coyote Valley and and further down. So that's a great question. We don't have a good answer for that. Um, we're going to be playing it by ear and using genomics to help guide us. And now, just the last two questions are related to habitat. So yeah. one of the questions is, why is the area around the Stanford Dish not good habitat for burrowing Ooh, owls? Yes. Is it too heavily used, or are the cows a deterrent? Because there seems to be tons of ground squirrels and open grassland there. Oh, I've been there so many times. And, and so a couple of things, um, and I didn't mention this too much, but breeding burrowing owls in our region and in other places, but certainly our region, are looking for flat <laughs> alluvial grasslands. These are places that have deep soils, lots of squirrels, and and this, the owls are looking for large, stable burrowing owl, uh, the ground squirrel populations. Okay, they do not seem to want to breed on hillsides or at any elevation. <laughs> you know, above like fifty feet. I mean, they just don't want to be there. And the the Stanford Dish area. Also, there are a lot of people over there. And honestly. It's just too many people also. The disturbance is too great. Um, but also, you know, we, you know, they do get winter birds every once in a while, but people are out and running around all over that dish area all the time. So it's not super great. Although owls will put up with a lot of disturbance in the wintertime, but 
basically they only get wigger owls once in a while. I hope that answered your question. Gotcha. Yeah, and that also answers the last question, I think, uh, which was why don't they breed in those hillside open spaces where there's so much less disturbance? And right. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so those those open spaces up above Coyote Valley, we were like, this is perfect. This is perfect for owls. Why aren't they here? You know, and but they really aren't. They aren't. I looked for them all over the place in winter and summer. And I looked in because at higher elevations, there are these perched valleys, you know, and there's agriculture up there and squirrels and stuff. No owls up there, no breeding owls. And I think that, <clears throat> I think this, the soil qualities, um, soil's relatively thin and rocky up there. I don't think they're, it just, you know, it just doesn't seem to provide, and maybe, maybe the, and maybe the forage isn't that good. Maybe there just isn't enough to eat. But there's one place nearby where there have been owls at elevation. That's at the Altamont Pass. And, you know, I have a colleague there trying to understand why they're there and not. There. <laughs> but, but in general, they simply don't want to be in the hillsides to breed. They just don't. But a lot of wintering owls up there. Oh, yeah, great. And then a last question snuck in here. Did you hear about the burrowing owl visiting Twin Peaks in San Francisco the last two winters? Uh, I did not. Uh, I usually hear about every owl that turns up. <laughs> I get pictures of it, which is great. I love that. And that's a wintering owl. Yep. And, um, you know, I asked Owl and Fish up there at uh, Golden Gate Raptor if they, they, they don't get any burrowing owls flying through, but they're migrating through. But they're probably you know maybe they're migrating at night it's probably a good indication they're migrating at night they're not migrating in groups or whatever so that owl yeah and two winters and, and it might very well be the same owl uh, we did have some owls come back um to the same site uh, for a couple of winters in a row and so they in the winter time they might show some site fidelity also just like they do in the, in the breeding season Right. It is 7 p.m. now uh, Pacific time, so I just want to bring everybody's attention to that. Um, we do have one more question, if you're okay with answering that. Um, are there are the Jepson Prairie burrowing owls migratory or year-round? Um, let's see. I don't know. I don't know out there. I would suspect that there's every chance they could be resident birds. and but you'd have to take a look at, you know, if people are seeing them in the breeding season or not. I haven't been out to Jepson Prairie in years, so I uh, don't know for sure. It's a, po it's a possibility, it's a nice big flat area. <laughs> and there are quite a few birds, you know, in the Central Valley. Um, so it's possible that there are um, breeding birds there. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for those wonderful questions. Thank you, Lynn, for this great presentation. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. First, uh, Lynn, is there anything else you want to share with everybody here that you haven't already mentioned? I think I'm pretty talked out, but I uh, <laughs> that no, no, I think uh, I think that was a pretty good data dump. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, Kristen, is there anything else that you want to say to everybody? So, I just want to thank everybody so much for coming. Um, yeah, I'll put up our final slide here. We hope, Lynn, that was a fantastic talk. I learned more than I even knew two years ago from your previous talk. Thank you so much for sharing all that information with us and um, also for your leadership with SFBBO. If you guys were inspired by Lynn tonight, um, please consider making a donation to our California Fall Challenge or participating in our online silent auction. We're able to continue this kind of sustainability work only with the support from our community. Thank you everybody for joining us. Wonderful, okay, thank you so much everybody. I hope you all have a great night and we hope to see you again for one of our future activities. Thank you. Thank you so much everybody. Mm -hmm.